Today I'm reading <clears throat> First Timothy uh, two. First Timothy two. And it says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman, woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. <laughs> so, the verses that stand out to me uh, in First Timothy 2 are, there are a lot of good verses in this chapter, but the first three. I guess also the first four for an entire context. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercession, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so, what stood out to me was the fact, number one, that he's telling us to pray for kings and for all that are in authority, but not pray for them that uh, specific things that they can do, like specific agendas or political policies or whatever, but that whatever they do would help us to lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So, not just who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So, what's acceptable to him is not just the fact that we're praying for the kings, that they may do whatever it takes for us to live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Um, and when I say whatever it takes, I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't mean like go kill other civilizations or whatever, but, you know, politics are very complicated and we're not supposed to spend our time thinking about, um, politics because that's not our, our job. It's very easy to get uh, drawn into that and trapped. Um, and so just a very simple thing is we're supposed to pray for them that they may help us to lead a quiet and peaceful life in our godliness and honesty. Um, because it's not just praying that though that is pleasing to God, it's also the quiet and peaceful life in our godliness and honesty that's pleasing to God. Why else would we be praying for that if that wasn't pleasing to God? So in a sense, that's the type of life where we're supposed to lead. And it's not in a sense, it's literally what it says. It says that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Um, and the may, you know, obviously, you know, acknowledges the fact that sometimes it's impossible to do that. If you were living, say, like during a war, and you have to pack up all your stuff and flee because, you know, the enemy um, troops or whatever, or the enemy lines are, you know, encroaching upon where you live and you don't want to be engaged in battle, you're going to have to pack up and leave. And so that's not necessarily a quiet and peaceful life. Or maybe something else happens, and, you know, there are un 
untenable circumstances, I don't know if that's the right word, where you can't lead a quiet and peaceful life. Now we can always live, lead a quiet and peaceful, or we can always lead a life in all godliness and honesty, it's just not always going to be quiet and peaceable. But that's what we're supposed to be aiming for. Um, and so, the reason it stands out to me though is, a lot of times it's easy to get different expectations about what, you know, life is supposed to look like. And that, if it doesn't look like a certain thing, we're somehow not doing it something right. We're not pleasing God. And that's false, because it says here that these this is acceptable to God. This is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. A quiet and peaceable life and all godliness and honesty is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And we see time and time again that God does not like people who are loud and stubborn and whose feet abide not in their house and who are pretentious and contentious and who are busybodies. Um, all of those things are condemned repeatedly and not just in the Old Testament and in Proverbs but also um, as far as um, the contentious and uh, busybodies and the pretense is also condemned in the epistles of Paul. Um, so let's go to 1 Timothy 6. Uh, 6, 6 through... Twelfth, it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. And so, unlike what the people who have not consented to wholesome words are saying, where they believe that gain is godliness, and it doesn't have to just be, you know, them trying to earn money, it could be a, a lot of different types of gain. Um, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Quiet and peaceful life and all godliness and honesty is what's acceptable to God. So there's sort of is a parallel that we're starting to establish. For we brought nothing into this world and is certain we can carry nothing out. But having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So in t terms of our possessions and our contentment, we're supposed to be content with food and raiment. And then on, add on top of that godliness. And the things that we're supposed to pursue after, and I've said this a million times, are spiritual things. And they're things that um, we can have in any circumstance. Even if the circumstance in which we live is not necessarily quiet and peaceful, we can still have these things. But as far as our the way that our life is supposed to look physically, it is supposed to be content, it is supposed to be quiet, it is supposed to be peaceable. Um, we're not supposed to get busy or caught up in the affairs of this life. And I'll go to a verse um, that mentions that after this. It says that the love of money is the root of all evil, um, and it's not just money, having money, that's evil. because. There are a lot of people in this world that don't have money. In fact, they take out loans. There are a lot of people in this country that are taking out loans constantly. They have credit cards and stuff. And are they somehow more or less evil than a, someone who has inherited a massive estate and is managing it well or something? I don't know. But it's not the money itself that is evil. It's the love of the money. The love of gain. Keeping up with the Joneses. You know trying to feel like your comfort, your safety, is in the money. It kind of reminds me, um, we'll come back to this chapter, but 
every morning I read uh, one verse in Proverbs through Song of Solomon. And I just keep cycling back. When I finish Song of Solomon, I go back to Proverbs and I read it one verse there every morning after reading my chapter. And today it was Proverbs 11, 28. And it says, He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Now let's go back to 1 Timothy 6. It's not just having money or not having money, the presence or absence of money. It's the love of money, the desire to trust that your sufficiency be in your money and say, we are financially stable. You're comfortable. It's like the guy in that parable that Jesus told about the farmer who had a great yield and he stocked up many barns. Um, he pulled down all his old barns and built new ones and had like years worth of uh, harvest for himself. Um, and he said unto his soul, you know, take good and rest um, or something like that and be, take pleasure or something. And um, the parable goes that, um, I don't remember if it was an angel or something, but he's, God says, or Jesus says, thou fool, you know, thy soul shall be required of thee tonight. Um, and so the sufficiency is not supposed to come from our possessions or our uh, money or the love of money. Uh, which basically sums up every aspect of this society. If you look down to it, it, it all comes down to, you know, in terms of society, um, everything is connected to the love of money because there's always that aspect to everything. It's not always the only aspect but um, it's always an aspect in this society. And it's the three pillars of, uh, of the world. The three pillars of the world as they teach. Um, this is uh, our, obviously, the people, the economy, and the environment. Or that's what they say, anyway. Um, and this is based off the wisdom of men. But it's just the acknowledgement of that nothing can happen in this world without uh, financial considerations. Um, and that's true, because the love of money is the root of all evil. And anywhere that you see evil going on, it's probably because, well, I shouldn't say probably because it says it is the root of all evil. There's probably some sort of, um, you know, greed or something going on there. And I can think of tons of examples, I just, that's, that's not really the point here. The point here is that we're supposed to flee these things um, and follow after righteousness. You know how it said the righteousness shall, the righteous shall flourish as a branch, whereas the, uh, rich man that trusteth in his riches uh, shall be destroyed. I think that's what it said. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall. So the terms are very uh, similar because it says right here that they w that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So we're not supposed to be following after those things. And if we know that the love of money is the root of all evil, and we look at society and we see evil, why then would we want to emulate the society in just mannerisms and traditions? And why would we set those things as expectations for ourselves, what we're supposed to be achieving in this life? Um, we're not supposed to seek those things. We're supposed to follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And what our life is supposed to look like physically is contentment, 
being content with food and raiment. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, well, aren't we called to, doesn't God promise us um, that we're going to live abundantly or whatever, or have great bountifulness? Um, and you got to be careful about wh where you take that from in the Bible, because we are the doctrine given to us, people who were Gentiles who have been baptized into the Holy Spirit, baptized into the body of Christ, everything toward us is very spiritual. There's a spiritual focus. Faith and grace is not like other people in the Bible, like the Jews, who they did have a spiritual part, but they also had a physical part. And when God promised them bounty and um, sufficiency and um, abundance, you know, it's actually because that was a promise to them. Uh, in Second Corinthians, he says, he talks about how if you sow, you shall reap. Well, that's very spiritual um, because we don't give with the hope of getting anything back. And we're not just giving money, even though money is one of the things that we can give. But it's not just talking about getting money back. It's talking about, if we go to Second Corinthians 9, we'll go to 6 uh, through really the entire rest of the chapter. It says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of the service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayer for you which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable speakable gift. So, this is a pretty, um, at a glance, it may be hard to un see what is going on here, but just read what the words say, and it's very easy to understand. Um, don't read into it, just read exactly what it says, and don't try to add or subtract from the word of God. So, if you sow, you shall reap. And he's talking just in a general sense. Um, God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. He doesn't say that all bounty will abound toward you. Or that all, you know, riches will abound toward you. Or abundance will abound toward you. Of money and wealth and possessions and people giving you stuff. He says grace. He says grace. <laughs> um, and that we have all sufficiency in all things that we may abound to every good work. Because our focus is to do the good works. Um, and it says here that multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So the fruit, what we're reaping, is not money. It's fruits of righteousness. <laughs> And so, the, being enriched to everything and everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. We are moving into the fact that when you give, it's not that when you give something, your time, your possessions, your effort, your money, anything, when you give it cheerfully, that you reap, but the things that you reap are not necessarily only physical and even if they were we rejoice more in the spiritual things that we reap thanksgiving 
if you give to someone, like when the Philippians sent support unto Paul, um, and he said it was like a sweet savor um, unto God, he gave thanks. Those are the things that are we we rejoice in greater is when there's cut when our bountifulness ca uh, causeth through us thanksgiving to God. And again, he says that in verse twelve. And again, the grace of God in you this unspeakable gift. So they're not being thankful for the money or whatever it was that they were giving and receiving. They're being thankful for the grace of God because that is, you know, what works inside of a person. The desire to, you know, give yourself for somebody else. And that's the grace of God. It says that in First Corinthians or Second Corinthians eight nine for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he is rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And that's the grace of God. And if he's able to make all grace abound toward us, you know, it's just us being poor so that others might be rich. And then eventually others doing that for ourselves as well. But that is the grace of God, and it's not just money. That is how we're supposed to be living to each other, giving ourselves for other people. Um, so let's go back to, I forget where I was. Um, let's go back to 1 Timothy 6. So we can see very clearly that um, even when it does mention money, Actually, let's go to that other verse real quick. Second Corinthians um, three. Okay, yeah, three, four, through five. And such trust have we through Christ to God word, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Our sufficiency is of God. So when he says that you being sufficient in all things, he's not talking about us expecting to like make money. Our sufficiency is of God. It's not of money. It's not of riches. It's not of wealth. It's of God. And so, in some sense, it may mean being okay with less. In fact, we see that in, clearly in First Timothy, that we're supposed to, with food and raiment, be content. And that is less than most people expect. But it's not that that is our sufficiency. Our food and raiment is not our sufficiency. Our sufficiency is of God. And he may provide our food and raiment, or give us the ability to work to have the food and raiment, but that is not where our sufficiency is. Our sufficiency is of God. It's not in the possessions. It's not in the materials. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2. Um, 1 through... Well, let's just focus this in. All of these verses are good, but let's go to specifically verse 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So, this deals with money, possessions, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, all that stuff, as well as politics, you know, just being involved in society, keep uh, following the fashions of this world, the traditions of this world. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We war. We fight the good fight of faith. It's, it's that simple. That is, 
you know, our calling, that is our charge. Um, but in order to do that, we cannot be entangled with the affairs of this life. It says in 1 Corinthians uh, 7, uh, 29 through 31, But this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. The fashion of this world passeth away. So we see that. But it's not just that it passeth away, it's that we cannot be entangled with it. There are some things in this world that are meat, but no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. This life is surrounded by affairs. We exist in a world of affairs. There are affairs everywhere. And when I say affairs, I'm hoping that you're understanding the true context, which is like issues or events or dealings or uh, drama or uh, things, not like, you know, a fair like a adultery, but like just issues. Um, so it's impossible to sort of hide yourself from the affairs, but we're not supposed to be entangled with them. Um, we're not supposed to be conformed to this world. We're supposed to war. So we're starting to see, you know, quiet where quietness and peacefulness comes in. Because if you're not living a quiet and peaceful life, then what are you doing? You're involved in affair, other people's affairs or the affairs of this life. And the only way for us to live, you know, in faith and warring and have that be what our focus is, is to live a quiet and peaceful life because that just promotes us keeping our priority straight, which is to war, to be a soldier, and to not get caught up in the issues and the affairs of this world. Um, 1 Timothy 4, 9 through 12, or 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12, it says, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. So we're supposed to love one another and to abound more and more in this. Um, you know, the love of Christ being that uh, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering to God and sacrifice to our sweet-smelling Savior. That is love, is giving yourself. It's very similar to what we saw grace is. Um, so, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, quiet and peaceful life, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. And so, a quiet and peaceful life, you know, that you study to be quiet. And this is a lot of things, it's this a lot of different scales where this takes place. You know, your conversation on a one-to-one -one basis, like when you're dealing with an individual person, your conversation overall, like how you're behaving uh, with yourself in relation to the world, like how you're managing uh, your house and uh, how your family is behaving, um, but also on a much broader scale, like what your choices as a whole are sort of adding up to. Are you getting involved in stuff? And does it uh, equate to being loud? 
and being contentious. Is the life that you lead loud and contentious or quiet and peaceable? Um, and the focus is on the spiritual things, but it doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want and have our lives look however the heck we want them to look like, chaotic and disorganized and loud and, you know, all these different things. You know, having food and raiment, we're supposed to be there with content. We're supposed to study to be quiet and to do our own business and to work with our own hands as he, they commended us. It's quite clear. Um, and so, whenever we start to formulate what life on earth should look like as a Christian, someone who's a member of the body of Christ, who's supposed to be warring the war of faith, um, we need to formulate that image based off of what we've seen here today. And to be careful to not uh, get caught up in um, coveting after the fashions of this world, which usually almost always come down to to money. And I say almost always, we know that they always do, but I say almost always because sometimes it's very difficult to see the connection, just because there's so much confusion in this world, and so much confusion about the motivations behind certain things and why people do certain things. And it's just a, a very, you know, blunt reminder of why we have to hold to faith and to hold to godliness and the word of God because um, that is our rock and that's never going to change. There's so much confusion in this world about not just what people are doing but why they're doing it. And um, there's no clear understanding of, you know, any motivation. It's just whim. Everybody acts on a whim. And sometimes those whims are a little bit more substantiated, uh, but ultimately when you get down to the meat and bones of any issue in this life, um, there's very little understanding of why a certain type of behavior or a certain belief or a certain issue is the way it is because it all comes down to just the flesh. Men believing what they want to believe for no other reason than their flesh just finds it, you know, pleasing to them at the time. Um, and so we've got to be careful to not get caught up in that because us believing the Word of God, it can at times be emotional and just a whim uh, because our flesh seems interested in it at the time but sustained faith, to have faith constantly, faithfulness, um, and to keep the faith requires us to let the effectual working come from God um, and from His Word. It says in 1 Thessalonians uh, 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the Word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And so, when we receive it, are we receiving it as the word of men, or as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in us that believe? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so, you know, when we fight the fight of faith, when we war, and um, we war in faith, it comes back to us being able to read the Bible and to hear, hear it as the word of men, or as, as it is in truth, not the word of men, to hear it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. And then faith will work in us because, you know, that's what happens when we hear. We have faith. And in, thus that, in us that believe, the word of God effectually works in us to do the things that we're supposed to do, to follow the high calling, um, to edify each other, to preach, and to apply it in ourselves, in our entire conversation, so that we become, our conversation becometh the gospel of Christ. Uh, it says in Philippians 1.27, 
Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, and may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so our conversation is supposed to become the gospel of Christ. And what we're supposed to be doing in order for that to happen is to be striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so now we see how it's connected. If we're striving together for the faith of the gospel, to keep the faith, like we just saw in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 about how faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and that if we believe the word of God, then it will effectually work in us. And when it effectually works in us, our conversation becomes the gospel of Christ. So, uh, that's what I got out of uh, 1 Timothy 2.